Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm in Osterville, Massachusetts, and we're gonna be doing a 2421 Generac standby generator here on this beautiful house on Cape Cod. So if you wanna learn about wiring generators, welcome to the channel, let's get to it. Yeah, fits real nice in there just like that, snug. This bit's off. Here I'm using an SDS Max 2 and 3 8 coring drill bit to make an oversized hole to fit 2 inch conduit through this hole. And on the other side, I'll be using a 2 inch LB so that I'm able to bend this oversized cable assembly down and then finally into the ground. Once I've measured the length of PVC to go through the poured concrete foundation, I cut it and then I take it outside here and I glue it up and I attach it to this two inch PVC fitting. It's called a PVC LB right here. And the reason why I needed to use that, like I said earlier, was because of the large size cable to be able to make that 90 degree bend and then go down into the trench that I'm standing in. I had to use an oversized fitting to protect the cable. Now that I've had my conduit in place there to protect the cable when it emerges into the ground, I'm rolling out this cable assembly. And this is specific for Generac generators. This is good for a 21,000 watt generator, which is what this standby generator is once we connect it to natural gas. You can get the full 24,000 watts out of this generator if you're connecting it to propane or liquid propane. So, once I roll out that wire, I roll it, uh, I actually pass it through the hole that I just drilled and through that LB connector into the basement here. You can see in the left hand side of the, of the screenshot there where I uh, pulled it through and then I pull it through the basement to where I need to exit the house on the other side of the house to where the transfer switch is. And so what I'm doing is I'm using number one, I'm sorry, I'm using one inch two hole PVC straps to secure this cable to the underside of the floor joist. And I'm using every other joist to make this uh, attachment to the home of, of the uh, cable assembly. So the code does allow for larger cables to be directly attached to the underside of the framing members here, these floor joists. Uh, I believe it's larger than number six. So a six three you can uh, attached directly to the bottom of these uh, joists as long as they're not subject to physical damage. You can see on the right side there that those are running boards and the running boards are pretty cool um, to avoid drilling holes in the framing members. Uh, so here this is the laundry room on the other side of the wall where I was just working and uh, obviously you can see it's unfinished here with some insulation which is good to see. I did notice while working up in Massachusetts this house is built very very well and I know the Massachusetts is very progressive with their codes and building standards. So it was nice to see some high quality work here. I believe this house was built sometime in the 1950s. And, um, you know, there's some finished portion to this basement here. Uh, but it was nice that it wasn't finished here because if you have a finished basement, and I'm trying to get this conductor from one side of the house to the other side of the house. Uh, most likely I'm going to have to open up some holes in the ceiling or I'm going to place 
uh, I'm going to place the wire directly to the ceiling, the finished ceiling sheetrock. Okay, so a few years ago I was here and I was asked to upgrade the service, uh, knowing that Sal Moore would soon be retiring and moving up here and living full time. So I came up here in 2021, I think, to upgrade the service. Here's the work I did. See the backer border here. And to be honest with you, I did a video for this project, but when I got home, the footage was, I don't know, corrupt. And that's how far we've come here. Um, this took about two and a half hours to get all this work done. The holes drilled and the feet are pulled. And so this afternoon we'll work on wiring up the generator and getting that all set. And uh, I think we're gonna break right now for some lunch. And we did have a delicious lunch of some turkey, roast beef, cheddar cheese, mayonnaise, on ciabatta bread with some ginger ale. It was fantastic. Uh, after lunch, I get back to work here and I gotta get this cable through this LB and laid into the trench before I can start working the conduit to go to the generator. Now, mind you, this is direct, rate, direct burial rated. Um, so getting it through there and protecting it before it goes into the earth is uh, pretty important. So once that's accomplished, now I can start working on how I'm going to attach my PVC and my flexible conduit here, the flexible PVC conduit, and how I'm gonna enter into this uh, generator. So yes, the bare cable is laying in that trench. Uh, like I said, it's rated for direct burrows, so I'm allowed to do that. But once it uh, comes back up to earth here and you're able to see it, you wanna protect that cable so if they grow some lawn back here, some grass back here, if they have a lawnmower or a weed whacker, you're not actually hitting that cable. Um, the cable is live with 240 volts, uh, 365 days a year because of the sensing terminals inside the transfer switch, which communicate with the generator terminals. So you constantly have voltage going back and forth between the transfer switch and the generator with this cable. So I take off the, the front part of the generator and then the side panel so that I can access the, um, the wiring compartment. Uh, but before I get there, I wanna do a rough layout of how I'm going to attach this PVC and make sure everything's gonna line up and work just right before I go to um, slide the cable assembly through this conduit and then finally into the generator. So you take a little while and figure out how you're gonna do this. I wish I had maybe used two inch conduit here going to the generator, but the opening for the wiring compartment is inch and a quarter. So I'd have to make another hole there. And I'd, uh, I prefer not to do that if I don't have to. So I'm using uh, inch and a inch and a quarter conduit here. And by the time I'm done here, all you see is the flexible conduit going into the earth along the back of this platform right here. And the reason why we have it up on a platform like we do is when it snows, it's gonna be easier to clear off just a small section of the platform. If you're enjoying this video, please hit the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment below. The reason why it's important to leave the sides of the generator clear for at least 36 inches on either side is because this is an air-cooled generator. So what that means is the generator actually uses the air to cool itself and to make a, the combustible engine run. So very important to have clearance on either side of the generator. And the other big thing that needs to be considered before you place the generator where you want to put it is that you're at least 60 inches or five feet away from any opening, such as a window or a vent on your house. This is very similar to a car. So you would not let a car run with this exhaust facing your window and let that exhaust into your house because that will kill you. Same thing with the generator. Uh, some people, I see people put these generators and never got inspections or any kind of permits or anything. And uh, I see most of the stuff on the internet, pictures of it. And I'm just appalled because it's not gonna work when they need the generator to work. So uh, open up the book, read it. If you're gonna try to do this yourself, and uh, find out what the limitations are as far as positioning the generator. And of course, if you're in a state that requires permits, 
you're probably going to have to submit a copy of the property survey uh, before the zoning can approve where you want to put your generator. So make sure you have three, three feet of clearance on either side of the generator and a minimum of five feet away from any opening in the house, such as a window or a vent. Uh, I'm not sure what the zoning is here in Massachusetts, but we were far, far enough away from any property line here where that wasn't really much consideration. But in some states, in some towns, you need to be a minimum of 10 feet away from the property line with the generator or five feet away in some towns here in New Jersey, like Springfield, New Jersey, for instance. But Clark or Cranford, you could be 10 feet away from that property line. I'm sorry, you could be five feet away from that property line and 10 feet away in some towns. I've been a Generac dealer since uh, 2014, and I took their special training class to do service on the generators. It's a three-day class that they crammed so much information that I really didn't wasn't able to obtain all of it. I've never been much of a motorhead, so to speak, as far as an auto mechanic. And you definitely need to have those skills to troubleshoot the generator here. So I'm just an installer now. I don't do any maintenance or service on the generators. I thought that was going to be a big part of my future. And when I ran into some troubles, I decided that I no longer wanted to do that. So now I sell one or two generators a year and hook them up for friends or, or repeat customers or the referrals. They're still pretty popular, not as popular as they were 12 years ago or 10 years ago after Hurricane Sandy here in New Jersey. Uh, but I still do enough of these every year uh, to keep my dealership uh, valid with Generac. And I highly endorse their products for sure. These are This is a great machine, uh, very practical as long as you keep up the maintenance on them, which means updating or changing the oil filter, the air filter, the spark plugs, and constantly doing a load test and maybe even wax the outside and closure of the generator to keep it new and uh, protect it for years to go. Okay, so inside the generator, you see they're colored, right? N1 and N2 with the black line going through it. So that's this yellow and black conductor here with the black stripe. All right, that's N2. And then we have obviously T1 is that goes there. Uh, then we have our black, red, and white. And that's our DC ground, our 12 volt DC, and 23 is the transfer. And we'll be connecting those the exact same way in the transfer switch when we go to put that in later. So if you have any questions down in the comments, thank you guys. Overall, I, um, I set aside one day just to do the wiring for the generator and to get that cable across the basement um, in preparation for the second day when I go ahead and turn the power off to the house and install the transfer switch. So here I am attaching my two hot conductors, obviously my grounded neutral and my equipment grounding conductor. And what I like to do is I like to connect my signaling wires first and then work with the, uh, with the feeders that supply power from the generator to the transfer switch when the utility power is lost. Here I'm reading directions for the battery heater that we ordered and also the um, oil filter heater that we had. This way when it gets cold, it goes below 32 degrees. There's a thermostat that's built in to these heaters and it keeps the battery warm and the oil filter warm. So we went ahead and did that. I hadn't done one of these in a while, so I wanted to up my, update myself on the directions and that's what I'm reading here. I just connected my cables for my battery heater and for the oil canister heater, which is there, okay? These are the two cables that connect to it. They're both 240 volt loads for the battery heater. It's 50 watts at 240 volts. That's the rating. So these little wires right here need 240 volts and they are derived from the utility power sensing contacts, which are right here, where you see N1 and N2 that's where they get connected.
Generac is constantly improving and updating their process of ordering generators and starting generators, including uh, the service side of things, which I did get involved with. I did pass their three-day course. I took it right here in New Jersey, in North Jersey, at a hardware store. I don't remember the exact place. But I was qualified to be a Generac service technician, but I just did not feel comfortable uh, repairing the motor. If something was to go wrong on the engine side, I just didn't feel confident. And um, to be quite honest, I did maintenance for many years, but uh, the trouble is as these generators get older, certain things might break on them. And uh, I wasn't comfortable making those repairs. And I thought my time was better spent doing electrical work rather than maintenance on these generators. So I no longer do the maintenance, but I do offer installing and wiring the generators and getting them started. Uh, so here, that's what we did, except the, the plumber at this particular job did not contact the utility ga natural gas company to upgrade their meter so that this generator had sufficient gas going to it. I believe it's between five and seven inches on the column. I'm not exactly sure if that speak is correct, but they did run a, um, an inch and a quarter line all the way from the gas main, which is where they'll tie this in, but that portion was not done. So even though I spent two days up here getting this generator wired up and ready to go, I was not able to start it up because it's still not connected to gas. So I will be doing that remotely with Sal, being that I am a Generac dealer. I do get certain perks with Generac, and one of those is some uh, limited assistance uh, when setting up the generator and uh, commissioning, it, commissioning it for startup. Uh, do me a favor, if you like this video, hit the like button and don't forget to watch part two coming up shortly.